Thank you. So, hello. Uh, my name is Mike Cooper. I'm very happy to be here. I come from Norfolk, Virginia. That's a few hours south of Washington, D.C., right on the east coast of the United States. Um, and I want to talk to you about vitamin C and severe infection. Um, up until a few years ago, I was saying this yesterday, I really knew very little about vitamin C. I think it was mentioned in a footnote on day 72 of medical school, and otherwise they didn't talk about it. Uh, so it was uh, something that I, I, I really knew very little about, and, and because of my experiences with one of my partners, uh, Paul Merrick, um, who, who uh, together we, we did a, uh, described our experience in the ICU, and it really has put this before from my mind, and I've started sharing this as, as much as I can. So I'm a pulmonary and critical care doctor. I spend my time taking care of patients, um, and I take care of a lot of patients with sepsis, which is uh, a severe infection um, that starts to threaten your organs and can lead to death. Uh, and that's a very high mortality rate, so I've watched a lot of people in my career die uh, as a result of sepsis. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about that and a little bit about how impotent we are as physicians to help those people and how we hope that we have uh, something that will finally uh, push us forward. So disclosures, I'm not making any money off vitamin C. I don't own stocks in any companies. I don't sell vitamin C to anyone. Um, so I have nothing financially uh, to gain from this. I am uh, the site PI on a steering committee for a current randomized controlled trial looking at vitamin C and sepsis. And so I'll talk a little bit about that at the end as well. I guess the only other thing I should disclose is, um, you know, I didn't sit bolt upright in economy for 16 hours to come talk to you about something that I, that I don't think works. Um, so I, I am a little bit biased uh, and, and, um, and this is something that I believe in. So uh, definition of sepsis, first of all, life-threatening infection uh, with associated organ failure is termed um, sepsis by medical professionals. Uh, the history of sepsis is very interesting, so it comes from a Greek word, sepsi, which is to make rotten. Um, it was described uh, before Christ by Hippocrates, and he started to describe wound putrefi uh, putrefication. So patients, or patients who had been wounded in battle or wounded by an animal, um, they would then get an infection, and then that would become systemic. Uh, fever in the presence of wound infection was something that was noticed uh, and measured. Um, and then uh, further on down the line, in the 1800s, we, start to be, we, we started to become aware that there were microbials or things in the environment that were, that were leading to this. And hand washing um, was described as something that could prevent sepsis. It was something that took about 100 years for us to start doing. Um, but it was something that, that at least got described. And so there's this clear link between microbial infection and sepsis, and that led to a lot of advances in the hygiene. People started sterilizing everything in the operating room. And then in the 1950s, we had the introduction of antibiotics as our first real inroads to treating these severe infections. And then uh, later on in the 1960s, it became more clear that, that the host response to infection was, was really what was killing people, not just the infection itself. Um, and people became more and more interested about what, what can we do to attenuate that response or control that response while we treat their infection uh, to try to keep people from dying. So just a little graphic to help people understand sepsis. So you have this big circle, which is infections, and that can include bacterial infections or fungal infections or viral infections. Uh, and then you have a big circle of physiologic disarray, so the systemic inflammatory response syndrome, or uh, which is an old term, we don't use that as much anymore, but, but physiologic disarray, which can happen because of trauma, or burns, or pancreatitis, or getting surgery. And when those two things overlap, when you have an infection that's causing that systemic inflammatory reaction, um, those are our septic patients. And with these patients, um, we, we, we know a few things, which is um, when they show up to us, 
and they have organ failure, uh, we know that that's a bad sign. And we also know that the more organs that are failing when these patients present, the higher their likelihood of death. So at the top, you just have the proportion of patients coming in with this systemic inflammatory response syndrome and infection. Uh, this is about half patients don't have organs failing yet. And then these are our septic patients over here where you start to see some with organ failure. And for every organ that they have down, their mortality rate starts to increase, uh, approaching 80%. So what do we do about it? Um, so standard treatment for infection, if you go back to the 1960s, was you would try to do source control, which is if there's a big you know, puddle of infection somewhere, a big abscess, then you would drain it or remove it or do surgery to take it out. Um, you would give the patient antibiotics. You would then physiologically resuscitate them with fluids or whatever you had to do to control their physiology. And then you do general supportive care. So all the good things that we do in the hospital to try to keep people alive. What we've seen is that the mortality rate for sepsis has come down some. It hasn't come down nearly as much as we'd like, but if you compare to the 1960s, it has come down some. And, and the question is, what are we doing? Why has it happened? Um, well, we had steroids introduced. Um, and that people started doing trials in that in the 1970s, 1980s. Uh, but then we had more trials saying steroids didn't really work. And then we had trials saying steroids did work. <laughs> and then we had some trials saying maybe steroids work. We're not really 100% sure. So one thing that is clear, steroids are maybe helpful, but, but they're not responsible for everything that got better. Um, we uh, started to, you know, became common sense, we had people in the ICU, we needed to feed them, so we started feeding them. And then people said, well, maybe we shouldn't be feeding them orally, maybe we need to be feeding them through vein. So we started doing that, and then we decided, no, we don't need to do that anymore, so now we're gonna start feeding them regularly again. Um, and so we keep, we keep doing that, that hasn't really gotten any better or worse. We had a drug that came out in 2000 called Zygris, or activated protein C, and this was a drug that we thought was really helpful for sepsis. We had a phase two trial that showed improved mortality. It got approved by the FDA. It got disseminated worldwide. Everyone was very excited about it. And then we had five more trials that showed that, that didn't work. Um, so that's now off the market. We don't use that anymore. And then we had uh, this decision to do tight glycemic control. So let's get people's blood sugar really, really, really well controlled and that will help infections. Um, and then we had more trials showing that really wasn't the right thing to do either. So, so that didn't really make things better. And then we uh, had a lot of immunonutrition um, studies come out. Um, we tried some omega-3 fatty acids, we tried arginine, we tried some other things, and then we had bigger trials and those didn't seem to work out. Uh, and so then we started doing all these other things, or in the midst of all this, we've been doing all these other things like endotoxin and LPS receptor antagonist and anti-TNF drugs and NSAIDs, which is a lead and ibuprofen. Uh, and a lot of other things, and none of those worked. And so what we're left with today is that we do source control, we give antibiotics, we resuscitate people a little faster, we've gotten a little bit more scientific about how we do that, and we just generally get better supportive care. And so, so unfortunately, when you look at the last 50, 60 years, big picture, there's not a lot that we're doing differently, there's not a magic bullet that's come out for sepsis that is spread around the world at this point. So the process of care has improved some, but that mortality rate has not come down nearly as much as we wanted to. Um, so again, the current standard uh, treatment for sepsis is find it early, give antibiotics, make every attempt to find the source and the cause of organism. If the source can be removed or drained, do it. Give them, give them enough fluid to make their heart pump well, support them with vasopressors, so this is like intravenous adrenaline uh, and related uh, medications to try to keep people's blood pressure up and to keep the heart pumping. Uh, and then we get good supportive care. And then we feed them, we try not to hurt them with the ventilator, uh, we try not to hurt them with all the sedatives we're giving, uh, we try not to let them acquire new infections in the hospital, and then we try to prevent clots. Big picture, that's, you look at all the guidelines, this is what it says that we should be doing. And like I said, there have been all these trials looking at molecules to affect this and that, 
and we look at all the pathways for why people get sick, sick with sepsis and all the cytokines that cause inflammation. We've tried to block it at every little step and nothing seems to work. Um, and why don't those things work? Well, because we have a very heterogeneous disease process, meaning it's, ca it's caused by a lot of different things, so all these different etiologies, and depending on what's causing it, it affects the body a little bit different. And all these proposed therapies, all these pharmacologic therapies, for the most part, are hitting one little part of that pathway. Um, and we also don't recognize these patients very early, so when you look at a lot of the trials that have been done, uh, therapies have been initiated very late into the course of, of their septic episode. So there's this general need for better tools. We need to do something better uh, to try to help these patients who have mortality rates for septic shock in the range of 30 or 40 or even 50% depending on the trial that you put in. So, my partner, Dr. Merrick, had been reading a lot about vitamin C uh, and a study had come out by Dr. Barry Fowler just up the road for, uh, from us in Richmond, Virginia, uh, looking at vitamin C and severe sepsis. And that was a trial that showed a lot of physiologic and biochemical benefits in these patients and a trend toward improved mortality. So it was something we were very interested in and had talked openly about. And then we had a patient camp come in. It was a 50-year-old lady, a 53-year-old lady, and she was hypotensive. Her blood pressure was very low. Her heart was beating really fast. She had a fever. Um, she had abdominal pain, her white blood cell count, which is a marker of inflammation, was sky high. Um, she had a procalcitonin, another marker of infection that was really high. Her lactate was high, showing that she was in shock. Her, re her kidneys were uh, failing, um, so everything was going wrong. She had a gallbladder infection. We put her on antibiotics and we admitted her to the ICU. On that first day, she had escalating doses of pressors, so this is that IV adrenaline that we're giving people to try to keep their blood pressure up. We're having to add more and more and more to keep the patient alive. Fluids weren't working. The patient was intubated, put on a mechanical ventilator for life support. Um, the interventional radiologist put a drain in the gallbladder to try to drain it. We started the patient on dialysis because their kidneys were failing. And we did an echocardiogram, which showed her heart wasn't pumping very well, which is something that commonly happens in severe, severe sepsis. So based on what Dr. Merrick had been reading about and what we'd been talking about, he started the patient on vitamin C and hydrocortisone. Now, hydrocortisone is a steroid that I mentioned earlier. is something that people are commonly using in septic shock, which didn't by itself have a market effect. But we had some reasons to believe that that combined with, with vitamin C would be helpful. So we gave those drugs, and what we saw, we thought was pretty remarkable, because we saw patients like this all the time, and when they're this sick, more likely than not, they're not gonna get better, and if they do get better, they're not gonna get better quickly. Um, but what we saw happen with this patient was from the time we gave the first dose of medications, and then we gave it every six hours, we saw that these pressure requirements started to come down and down, and down, and after 18 hours, her body was supporting her blood pressure on its own. So we weren't having to give these IV medications anymore to make that happen. On the second day of the ICU stay, no longer needed these blood pressure medications. She was able to be taken off the ventilator. Her kidneys started working again. Dialysis was stopped. Her blood cultures that had been taken when she first showed up grew out these bacteria, again, just proving that this was sepsis. Her heart function improved on a repeat echocardiogram. She was transferred to the medical floor on the fourth day, so out of the ICU. And then by the eighth day, so just a little over a week after, she, after she'd come in the hospital, she was able to be sent out of the hospital uh, to home. So that was a good story, anecdotal medicine. That was one case. Um, but it was something that we were interested in. So we had a case come in only a couple days later. Um, this was a urinary tract infection, a kidney stone blocking the uh, kidney from draining, an infection, uh, uh, pyelonephritis causing the patient to be sepsis, septic, and we saw the same sort of thing. They were really sick with septic shock, needing all these medications to stay alive. We started them on therapy, and this time we included thiamine, which I didn't put on this slide, and what we saw was those pressure requirements, all three of these adrenaline-like agents 
uh, were stopped after about 20 hours. Our third case came in not long after that, and by this point we were hooked, we were addicted to vitamin C, <laughs> no choice but to give it. And so on day four, the patient wasn't getting better, and the, the prior cases were shock patients. This was a patient with a severe pneumonia uh, and a lot of trouble uh, on the ventilator. And this is a marker of oxygenation, and what we saw on the fourth day, we gave those medications, and the patient's oxygenation rapidly improved. So, we all talked. This looked like it was something that worked. The medications were in our pharmacy. They weren't approved for sepsis, but they were approved for other things, and we use things all the time in the hospital for diseases they aren't approved for. Um, and so we started using it. You know, these are vitamins. This is a steroid that we've been using for 50 years. So this was a fairly non-objectionable series of medications. So we just started using this regularly. We trained our residents. Um, we got consensus in our ICU. And from then on out, if a patient came in with severe sepsis or septic shock, we were treating them. And we continued to see cases like this. Patients getting better. Uh, patients get leaving the ICU that we didn't think would even live through their episodes. And so we felt like we had to describe that experience. Uh, and so we did with this paper, which was written by Dr. Merrick and several supporting authors. And we described our experience in our ICU for a period of time before we started using this therapy and for a period of time after. <clears throat> so our treatment group was 2016, January to July, all consecutive patients in our medical ICU with a primary diagnosis of sepsis and this procalcitonin marker, which is a sign of infection that was positive uh, and had received our therapy. We compared them to a control group from 2015, June 2015 to December 2015, and those were all consecutive patients in the medical ICU with the same inclusion criteria. The patients were not any, I mean, obviously the patients were different, they were different patients, but when you start looking at their characteristics, they look pretty similar as a group. And there are 47 in each group. Uh, their ages were not terribly dissimilar. Gender, how sick they were in terms of needing mechanical ventilation or needing these IV vasopressors to keep them alive. Markers of infection or shock or organ failure were pretty similar. And one thing that we noticed, we didn't measure it in all patients, but in the patients we did, their vitamin C levels were very low, and this had been well described by other people prior to us. In terms of comorbid conditions, so anytime you do a, a non-randomized, unblinded um, trial, people are going to say, well, you saw an effect, but, but the patients were different. So we, we looked at comorbid conditions as well in terms of hypertension, high blood pressure, heart failure, lung disease, liver disease, stroke, malignancy. In terms of all these things, there wasn't a significant difference in the patient. So there wasn't some associated or, or other condition that could explain the difference we saw. Uh, the type of infection they had was very similar, 40% with pneumonia, about 20% with a urinary source of infection, and this is what we see in sepsis trials, proportions very similar to this. Um, these are severity of illness scores, so quantitative measurements of how sick someone is based on comorbidities and lab testing, medications that they're requiring, how much oxygen they're requiring, things like that. And when you looked at this in a quantitative way, the patients looked pretty similar, and their predicted mortality based on their numbers alone was about 40% in both groups. And when you look at this graph, you'll see four bars. And one of these things does not look like the others. <laughs> the best way to describe this. Um, but the black bar is the predicted mortality for the patients in the control arm before we started doing this and then in the treatment group, and then the actual mortality, what we actually saw and measured, is the gray bar in the control group or in the treatment group. So we saw mortality rates go from about 40% to down to around 10%. So a pretty remarkable effect. And when we looked at physiologic data and other things, it 
correlated with this, so it made sense. So the vasopressors, which are talking about this IV adrenaline people were receiving, um, we were able to, whoops, we were able to have that come off very quickly in the intervention groups, in the control patients, even the ones that lived, taking out the ones that, that died, um, it took a lot longer, so 40 to 50 hours for those vasopressors to be turned off in those patients. Uh, and obviously the ones that died, um, their vasopressors were never turned off. So, <clears throat> vitamin C, I think we've talked a lot about this, so I won't belabor this slide, but it's essential water-soluble nutrient which cannot be synthesized or stored in humans. Deficiencies associated with scurvy, a fatal multi-system disease, much different than sepsis uh, in its description, but affecting a lot of organ systems just like sepsis does. Uh, vitamin C is pluripotent. It has a lot of different effects. Um, it's a potent antioxidant, um, and it reduces and maintains other antioxidants. It's a reducing agent, and in that role, uh, it affects collagen synthesis, cortisol, or steroid synthesis, so endogenous or uh, steroid synthesis, catecholamine, so adrenaline, and molecules like it. And then neurotransmitters, the things that make our brain uh, and nerves function and work the way that they should. Um, this is just a graph which might have been shown earlier, I'm not sure, but uh, it shows that you know, the animal kingdom is very good at making vitamin C themselves because it's necessary, you need it. Um, but for whatever reason, uh, in primates and guinea pigs and, and ourselves, uh, it's something that we require to consume in our diet or to be given um, by especially forward thinking physicians. <clears throat> um, so in critically ill patients and in particular septic shock patients, vitamin C levels are low. Uh, Dr. Carr, or Nitra Carr, um, just described this. So 90% of septic shock patients had low vitamin C levels. And we were aware of, of these similar types of descriptions before we did our trial. Um, if you just give nutrition and regular amounts of vitamin C and nutrition, uh, then you do not see vitamin C levels recover in septic or non-septic uh, critically ill patients. Um, so our trial was a before-after trial, and those are always criticized in medicine. Uh, physicians and scientists are skeptics, and they're paid to be skeptics, and, and, and we, we support that to some degree. Um, but there is randomized controlled data also that supports uh, what we're doing. And so there was a trial of 28 critically ill surgical patients in septic shock, and they were given either IV uh, vitamin C every six hours for three days at, at this dose uh, or placebo. And they looked at endpoints of this vasopressor dependency uh, or mortality and saw something really not too dissimilar to what we described, so a significant drop in mortality in those patients that received vitamin C compared to those that didn't. And again, this was in a randomized controlled study, albeit small. Dr. Fowler, who I alluded to earlier, um, showed that organ failure scores in patients who were on either high dose, so slightly higher than we gave, or what he called low dose, which is slightly lower than what we gave, vitamin C, their organ failure scores improved significantly versus patients that did not receive vitamin C. 